Hello, it's Howard Rheingold. This is the second in a series of videos about network literacy. In the first episode, I spoke about why it's important to understand how networks work, whether or not you know or care about the engineering or technical aspects of them. And in particular, I spoke about the way that the technical architecture of the Internet reserves innovation for the endpoints of the Internet, for the users of the Internet, rather than any kind of centralized control. The enormous creativity and productivity of the World Wide Web is a direct result of that technical architecture. One of the architects of what has been called the Internet's end-to-end -end principle was David Reed. I had the privilege of talking with, with David in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he is a fellow at the Media Lab, when I was researching my book Smart Mobs in 2001. And I asked him about what he was calling Reed's Law, which is a way of valuing the kinds of networks we participate in, the way the structure of those networks affect the value that can be derived from those networks. He started off by referring to Sarnoff's Law. David Sarnoff, of course, was the, the founder of the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, one of the pioneers of television, and he made the perhaps now obvious remark that the value of the network depends on the number of receivers. That is, if you, if you have a television broadcasting network, it's not worth much if you only have two people who are receiving your signal. If you have millions of people receiving your, your signal, then there's a great deal of value in it. For the broadcaster, this is really a few-to-many broadcast network in which the, the value is derived primarily by the person who broadcasts to many who receive it. In the 1970s at Xerox Park, a, a great number of, of wizards assembled to create what we now know as personal computing. One of them, Bob Net Metcalf, invented the, the form of networking known as the Ethernet. He later left Xerox Park and and started the 3Com company, from which he made a great deal of money, became a venture capitalist. And he also noted Metcalfe's law, which is that the value of the network grows with the square of the number of nodes. Now, that, that's pretty simple to understand if you think about when fax machines first came about, before the internet. One fax machine is worthless. Two fax machines are, are valuable for the two people who can send material to each other. But of course the, the value of a network rises when you have hundreds, thousands, and eventually millions of machines. Now that value of the network is the value of each node multiplied by every node it can communicate with. That means that the value of the network rises with the square of the number of nodes. So if you have two nodes, the value is four. If you have four nodes, the value is 16. It rises pretty quickly in that regard. When the value of a network increases so much more quickly than the number of nodes in the network, then the, the mathematical consequence translates into economic leverage. That means that connecting two networks creates far more value than the sum of their values as independent networks. And that was one of the, the reasons, although it wasn't stated that way, in creating an internet that connected the many different networks that existed in the 1960s and 1970s. When I talked to David Reed, he pointed out that he had uh, what he called his first eureka when he thought about why eBay is so successful. Now eBay, of course, doesn't sell any merchandise itself. It provides a market uh, for customers to buy and sell from each other. Uh, as David Reed put it, eBay won because it facilitated the formation of social groups around specific interests. Social groups on eBay form around people who want to buy or sell teapots or antique radios. Now at that time, Reed had been reading Francis Fukuyama's book about social capital. His, his book was, was called Trust. And he noted that there's a strong correlation between the prosperity of national economies and social capital, which Fukuyama defined as the ease with which 
people in a particular culture can form new associations. I, I have a, a different definition of social capital that's, that's somewhat related, which is it's the ease with which uh, people can get things done together without going through institutions. And Robert Putnam defined social capital in terms of networks of trust and norms of reciprocity. So, as Reed was explaining his Eureka, he said that he realized that the millions of humans who use the millions of computers uh, on the network that eBay was part of added another important property to the additive properties of Sarnoff's law and the uh, exponential properties of Metcalfe's law, which is the ability of the people in the network to form groups significant difference between a network of fax machines and a network that connects human beings. Reed said, I remember that when it became possible to send and reply to entire groups in email, it became possible to create ad hoc discussions. And that's of course what virtual communities grew from. We got message boards, list serves, buddy lists, auction markets, Usenet, all kinds of ways for people to form groups online. David Reed uh, started calling these group forming networks. The telephone network, for example, is not exactly a group forming network. Although it's, it's possible to have conference calls, it's mostly one to one. Reed saw that networks that connected humans, that enabled them to form groups with each other around mutual interests, grow even faster, much faster than Metcalfe's law. Reed's law holds that the value of the network grows proportionally not to the square of the number of users, but exponentially. Now that means you raise the number two to the power of the number of nodes instead of multiplying the number of nodes, that is squaring them by itself. So the value of two nodes is four under Metcalfe's law and Reed's law, but the value of 10 nodes is 100 10 to the second power under Metcalfe's law, and 1,024, 2 to the tenth power under Reed's law. And those differential rates of growth uh, climb the hockey stick curve from there. That explains how social networks, enabled by email and other social communications, drove the growth of the network beyond the communities of engineers to include every kind of, of interest group. I'm going to talk about the importance of multiplying social networks by technical networks a little later. Reed's law is a link between computer networks and social networks. Reed, using his law to analyze the value of different kinds of networks, believes he has discovered an important cultural and economic shift. I'm going to quote him here from our interview. There are really at least three kinds of value that networks can provide the linear value of services aimed at individual users, like a fax, the square value from facilitating transactions, and exponential value from facilitating group affiliations. What's important is that the dominant value in a typical network tends to shift from one category to another as the scale of the network increases. Whether the growth is by incremental customer additions or by transparent interconnection, Scale growth tends to support new categories of killer apps and thus new competition. We can see this scale-driven value shift in the history of the internet. The earliest usage of the internet was dominated by its role as a terminal network, allowing many computer terminals to selectively access a small number of costly time-sharing computer host mainframe computers. As the internet grew, much more of the usage and value of the internet became focused on pairwise exchanges of email messages, files, etc., following Metcalfe's law. And as the internet started to take off in the early 1990s, traffic started to be dominated by news groups, user created mailing lists, special interest websites, following the exponential group forming network law. Although the previously dominant functions did not lose value or decline as the scale of the internet grew, the value and usage of services that scaled by newly dominant scaling laws grew faster. Thus, many kinds of transactions and collaboration that had been conducted outside the internet 
became absorbed into the growth of the Internet's functions, and these became the new competitive playing field. What's important in a network changes as the network scale shifts. In a network dominated by linear connectivity, value growth, content is king. That is, in such networks, there is a small number of sources, publishers or broadcasters of content, that every user selects from. The sources compete for users based on the value of their content, whether it's published stories, published images, standardized computer uh, consumer goods, or, or television programs. Where Metcalfe's law dominates, transactions become central. The stuff that is traded in transactions, be it email or voicemail, money, securities, contracted services, or whatnot, are king. And where the group forming network law dominates, the central role is filled by jointly constructed value, such as specialized news groups, uh, joint responses to requests for proposals, gossip. Reed believes there is a direct connection between the kind of social capital that Fukuyama discusses in his book Trust and the way people use the internet as a group forming network. This connection is the reason why esoteric, technical, and legal arguments about the end-to-end -end principle and wireless regulation might have a huge effect on everybody in the world. If the innovation commons is open to many in the future, as it has been in the past, a cornucopia of the commons could make it possible for many to benefit. Or those who have concentrated capital in existing infrastructures and corporations might manage to enclose the commons and reserve that power of innovation by technically excluding future innovators. The first battle was fought over Napster. The established interests won, triggering an effort by innovators to invent knowledge commons that can't be enclosed. I want to talk now about the relationship of social networks to these technical group forming networks that, that Reed refers to, because I think that multiplication of value as Reed pointed out, it's not just economic value, but it's social capital. The capacity to get things done without money or without institutions like, like government. Social networks are probably as old as humans. If you think about it, our ability to organize collective action using symbolic communication is probably what enabled our, our very powerless ancestors to survive on the savanna. The, the primates who came down from the trees and evolved into Homo sapiens were, were, were very small. They, they didn't have claws or, or wings. Uh, they couldn't run very fast, but they were able to communicate with each other. They were able to organize collective defense and collective food gathering. Arguably, our ability to use symbols, first speech and eventually writing, and then the, the mechanization of writing through print, the telephone and the internet, turning that mechanization into the speed of light. These capabilities of humans to socialize and to take advantage of that, that socialization really is what makes us homo sapiens. Social networks are something that humans have created since forever. As I'll talk about uh, later when I talk about Manuel Castells, there are, of course, natural limits to human social networks. We can only communicate with the people who can hear us if we're talking through, through speech, and writing greatly extends that. But the number of people we can organize very quickly, the geographic spread of those people, the diversity of those networks, those are all are rather limited until we get media like the Victorian internet, the telegraph that first wired up the world in the 19th century, and now the internet. Those networks with the properties that David Reed talks about multiply our human capacity for social networking and lower the thresholds for, for some of the capacities to organize with others and in, in some cases eliminate obstacles that prevented us from organizing with people on the other side of the world in a matter of seconds, for example. So when you look at networks, I think you have to understand that the great power of the networks is not only in the, the technical aspects that Sarnoff and Metcalf pointed out, but in the social aspects that Reed pointed out. 
In my next episode in this series, I'm going to talk about why networks matter. I'm going to primarily focus on Manuel Castell's work around the network society, but I'm also going to refer to social capital and some of Robert Putnam's work about social capital.